I would like to thank everybody for returning for TH and P meditation and coloring. And I got a surprise in the mail on Saturday from Penzi. Someone nominated us. I'll read once we start coloring. Um, but I got that hug blanket from Penzi's. And so this is the last week that we will be doing the coloring and meditation. Um, we'll be starting something new next week. Go ahead, make sure you have water to drink, a snack if you haven't eaten, or dinner. Get comfortable. Get your pencils, coloring pencils, and your coloring book. So the letter from Penzi said, We heard you could use a hug. So please accept this one from us at Penzi's and from our hundreds of thousands of customers as well. You care. That means everything. Most days, caring about others is the pathway to happily ever after. But on the days of loss, on the days of setback, caring can feel like your heart breaking into a million little pieces. This is exactly why this hug blanket is now in your hands as a reminder that your heart is far stronger than you think. Our world needs people like you, people who care. Please find your place in your life to be hugged. Maybe it's on your lap while reading or listening to something, across the top of your bed at night, or simply draped over your shoulders where you can feel the full weight of its embrace. You are special and this blanket is for you. Please give it a chance to be a part of your life. And please hang in there. Be strong when you can be strong and know that there is a world of people out there who care about you and wish for you to feel hugged. We all need your strength. Please nurture it where you can. Thanks for being you. You matter. Bill Penzi. Imagine if this was actually the norm. I don't know who nominated me to get a hug. I don't know if it was for trauma healing and prevention or if it was for me individually. It um, was delivered to us with a note. It did not include who nominated us. I have nominated people in the past with Penzies when they do their hug blankets. It's a beautiful gift to give someone. We would not be facing the problems that we're facing right now in the world if this was the norm. The reality is we cannot afford, we can't afford to just completely avoid media. We do need to be cognizant of what's happening in the world around us. And we have a responsibility to check in on our fellow human beings. I'm not sure how many people are engaged in mutual aid. If it were not for mutual aid here, there were periods during 2020 um, where we would have gone without food. When we got COVID in March of 2020, mutual aid delivered medications and food and did contactless deliveries. I've been looking at social media this week, trying to catch up. And I've seen a lot of people getting very frustrated and being very reactive. Being angry about what's going on around us is an appropriate reaction. It 
it's not the emotions that are a problem. It's how we react instead of slowing down and choosing to act. The goal of trauma healing and prevention services is to help people remember the skills that most of us at some level knew when we were born. And then depending on how the adults around us handled their strong emotions, handled their frustrations, we either learned that emotions are something that come and go and we can acknowledge them or we can stuff them down until they blow up or we can detach go through life trying to emulate Spock with no emotions, no emotional reactions, because somehow we have bought into the belief that emotions are bad. The reality is our emotions are here and they serve a very important purpose. They're kind of like traffic lights. They alert us that there's something that we need to pay attention to. They alert us to pay attention to a beautiful butterfly flying across a field or a child laughing so that we can join in that joy. They also alert us to when other people are possibly exploiting our trauma and taking advantage of us. But that can only happen, we can only be cognizant of that if we are aware of the emotional responses that we're having and we have learned how to get comfortable just sitting with the emotion, not trying to avoid it, not trying to detach from it. Sometimes we can wake up in the middle of the night and just have a good tear, cry so hard it racks our body with sobs. We know when we wake up the next morning, every muscle in our chest and throat is going to be sore. Now, some people have been conditioned that that's not healthy and you're supposed to avoid that emotional response at all cost. And people who avoid that emotional response at all costs will be grumpy and tired and irritable. But if we've been lucky enough to have someone in our life who has helped us understand that those feelings are normal and appropriate and to allow them like a spring thunderstorm to come through, rain hard, wear us out. We acknowledge the feelings and then we let them go.
the interesting part is the harder we try to run away from those feelings, the harder we try to detach ourselves from those feelings. Whether they're feelings of rage, feelings of anger, feelings of fear, feelings of despair and sorrow. If we don't acknowledge that that emotion has a right to exist, then it's going to find some dark corner to hide in and it's going to keep growing until one day it explodes and everybody will go, where did that come from? And then the individual who explodes will feel shame and the cycle will repeat itself. If we look at it and go, okay, I was blue. I've acknowledged the blue and now I'm going to move on. I've sat with it. I'm not ready to be completely happy yet and that's okay. But I'm going to go out. I'm going to find some nice brown dirt. And I'm going to get my hands in the dirt or I'm going to get my feet in the dirt and I'm going to smell the soil. I'm just going to sit here and feel the earth and reconnect. And if we give ourselves permission to slow down to experience the emotions as they come up, to acknowledge them and validate them. And if the emotions feel overwhelming, go look for a place where we can get our feet in the soil, our hands in some dirt, plant some flowers, pull some weeds, If we're apartment living, we can get a small aquarium. The sound of the water is soothing. Trimming the plants is almost as rewarding as having a yard and with far less overhead. Everything that happens in life there's always more than one perspective of how to look at it. The old mantra of is the glass half full or is the glass half empty keeps us focused on a scarcity mindset. The reality is the glass could be refilled As long as we're supporting our water protectors, as long as we're doing what we can to minimize the amount of oil and petroleum products that we're using so that there's not a market for them. As long as we're contributing to the water protectors legal fund, then that glass is going to be refillable. I've heard a lot of people who haven't had the experience or the opportunity to experience how to change something that we don't like. How to change something that we cannot accept.
In my grandfather's day, they fought hard to get us unions because they knew that people working together were stronger than any CEO. If you're lucky enough to live in an area that still has a strong and healthy indigenous population, if you show up, if you're willing to show up and be vulnerable and take responsibility for your choices, if you show up and you're willing to follow directions, and be a support person and not a person in charge. If you show up and you're willing to listen and learn and screw up and when you screw up take ownership of it. Most of us do not have that opportunity in our daily life. Most of us as children were not given support when we screwed up. We were shamed, punished, put in time out. Our parents did those things because if you go back enough generations, they thought that that was the only way to keep children alive. But not everybody in the globe raises children that way. I have been in areas where people would sooner cut off their own hand than ever hit a child. And that is how healthy humans behave. We protect our children not by punishing them, not by giving them negative consequences when we don't like their choices. We protect our children by supporting them so that as they grow up into adults, they learn what healthy support feels like, they learn what healthy support looks like, and they learn how to give healthy support to other people. They learn that making a mistake isn't the end of the world. It's one of the best ways to learn how to do things. It's not something that everyone has had the opportunity to fully explore. Learning how to fail big, spectacularly, so that we can have the opportunity to grow out of that experience so that we have the opportunity to be vulnerable and learn that being vulnerable is how we deepen our relationships with other people. These are the thoughts that I have while I color. I think about Have I done anything today that accidentally did harm? Have 
and what does taking responsibility for that harm look like? I think about how did we get from people who lived in relationship with the land because we knew that if we don't take care of the land, the land can't take care of us. I think all of us grew up being told, either by a parent, a teacher, a boss, a mentor, you don't date where you work because you don't defecate where you eat. I wonder who started that. Because where our food grows best is in soil where the plants are allowed to decompose back into the earth. Before intensive farming, we didn't pump lots and lots of nitrates into the soil to grow plants faster. In the beginning, we would find fruits that grew on bushes, we'd dig up roots, we'd carry those foods with us as we traveled. And as we ate and left behind seeds, more plants would grow along the route that we traveled. And then it became intentional. We found that some plants grew better in some areas, other plants did not. And we worked with the plants. We didn't dig up agave out of Mexico and try to force it to grow in Washington State. We didn't have invisible lines on pieces of paper and said people had to stay on that side of that line or on this side of this line. That's not how healthy human beings interact with each other. It's not how they interact with their environment. It's not how they interact with plants or with animals. And so while I color, I wonder, what happened to my ancestors that made them think that it was okay to treat other human beings as if they were less than human? I wonder which one of my ancestors was treated as less than human. I wonder where that particular intergenerational trauma began. And the reality is, we may never know. What I do know is I want a better world for my children. And I want a better world for my grandchildren. And I can't change anyone else. I can change me. I can be the friend that I always wished I had. I can listen to my kids and be the parent that they needed. And I'm not always going to get it right. I am going to screw it up. I have already screwed it up. What I didn't do was give up. And I have chosen to surround myself with other people who don't give up. 
and it's not easy. There are days that it just outright, if it were a fish, as my mom would say, I'd throw it back. And our life can only be what we're willing to make of it. We can't control everything. Sometimes we can't even control what's happening with our own body. I had a stroke a year ago. I used to be a professional dancer, and now I can't. I still dance on the days I can. And I color on the days that I can't. Human beings see beauty. It's our innate nature. And the only time that we don't see beauty or that we don't help other people is because somewhere along the way we learned we can't. And what I hope to do with trauma healing and prevention is help people reconnect not by doing anything for them, but by asking questions. Asking questions like someone else who cared about me asked questions until someone has the aha moment. I can't do the work for anyone else. What I can do is ask questions and share what I've experienced and walk beside people. So what are the questions or the thoughts that you have while you're coloring? I'm also sitting here wondering who sent me that blanket. So if you're watching this video live stream, thank you very much. For everyone who's here for the live stream on Monday night, thank you for engaging in the live chat. Thank you for asking your questions. And for everyone who's catching this on the replay, Thank you for taking the time to come back and watch this video. I hope everyone is well hydrated. 
I hope that no one watching tonight is hungry. I hope that everyone's needs are met. That everyone has safe shelter and clean water. And air to breathe. Above all, I hope that coloring brings a sense of calm, an inner peace, a willingness to try something new. Sometimes life is a bit like a coloring book. You can race through it to get to the end, to complete the journey, focused only on the end. But that's a micro part of the entire experience. I suspect that far too many of us have been trained to only focus on the end result. And by only focusing on that end result, we miss so many opportunities. And then we wonder why we're exhausted and worn out. Because our body wanted us to go slower. Our brain needed us to take time to slow down and really study a flower or a leaf. Our brains need us to look for that void, the empty space between things. If we rush, rush, rush through the day, doing our job, taking care of our children, going to work, going to doctor's appointments, making meals, eating, cleaning up. We miss 90% of the experience. And our body will try to tell us to slow down. When I'm coloring too hard, or I get too focused on wanting to see an end result, my hands will start cramping as a reminder that I need to stretch my fingers out and just look at the work that I'm doing. Look at how the colors are coming together. Look at the areas where I can add details. If we don't take those times to 
slow down. To notice where we can add details to bring more joy. We're shortchanging ourselves. We are adding to our own depression and our own stress. But if we slow down and take the time to fully experience things, instead of avoiding it because we think it's going to be uncomfortable, then we're allowing our body the opportunity to develop strengths that we would have rushed past if we were only to listen to the conditioning that we've been given since we were children. How many people watching this video right now can remember asking why the sky was blue as a child? Did anyone ever sit down with you and look up at the sky and stop everything that they were doing and fully engage you on the level where you were to talk about the sky and the color blue. If you didn't have that experience, that opportunity as a child to play with using the sides of a pencil versus the tip, to play with different textures, to play the why is the sky blue game. Try to give yourself some time this week to go outside and just look at the sky. And find out why the sky is blue. Does anyone know the plants and the flowers that are indigenous to the area that they're living on right now? Have you been out lately and looked at what flowers are starting to bloom? if those flowers are indigenous flowers to the land that you're on. Or are you looking at a flower that somebody brought with them when they traveled on a boat? Are you looking at a flower or a plant that was imported from another country and sold? at a big box store. If it's a plant that came from another country and was sold at a big box store, what can we do to interrupt that cycle?
How can we shift things so that we're paying more attention to what's nearby, what's readily available? I know that the audience for most of the videos lately have been mostly from North America. We also have some viewers from Australia and we have some viewers from Eastern Europe. And I don't know about everywhere else but here in the U.S. City planners for a little while came up with a brilliant idea that they didn't want people to have to clean fruit off of the sidewalks. So they intentionally only planted male trees. They thought that this would mean people would have to spend less time on lawn maintenance. They thought it would keep the sidewalks and the streets neater and prettier. And I suspect they also wanted to deprive certain populations of people of freely accessible food because we do have a history of doing that in this country. The side effect, the unintended consequences of choosing trees based on the ability to deny people access to free fruit has led to an increase in allergies and people suffering in the spring and not being able to breathe and coughing and sneezing and having itchy eyes. So if you're one of the people who is suffering with me, with spring allergies right now. I encourage you to look up at the library which city planners and what zoning happened and when. And if you have the spoons, if you have the energy, see what you can do to change that. See if there are people you can talk with across most of the country in the 1930s and 40s because of the Great Depression. They sent people out in work camps to work across the country. This is how we got a lot of our national parks. Instead of returning the land to the people who belong to the land, we opted to develop national parks and city parks and county parks. And instead of keeping the plants that would grow there naturally, they cut trees down and put in sidewalks and roads and houses, sometimes clear-cut entire lots to put in new houses, and then planted trees like elms or juniper or cottonwoods, sometimes maple. A lot of those trees 
because they were not planted in communities of trees and they did not have a grandmother tree help the young trees know when to send sap down to the roots and how to change pinings and other chemicals in the tree to fight off various pests and because people did not all understand the importance of taking care of the earth and the plants that grow in it and the animals and the insects. We have unintentionally done harm and introduced insects that have damaged our trees. And because there weren't any grandmother trees left because they'd all been cut down, the young trees didn't know how to protect themselves against the insects. And so now we are seeing in these storms a lot of trees coming down. And a lot of people could spend a lot of time and energy being very upset about the things that have already happened. We can also look at this as an opportunity to do better this time. We can talk to our city planners and ask for positive reinforcements for people choosing to stick with native species. Work with homeowners associations and, and city planners so that instead of watering grass lawns, especially in areas where grass doesn't grow naturally and doesn't belong, We can keep food instead of lawns. We can plant the native indigenous flowers that support the local bees and butterflies. But these things can't happen unless people are willing to contact elected representatives and not yell at them and not argue and not be mad but stay very calm and say, we didn't know any better in the past, and now we know better. Since we know better, why aren't we doing better? What do you need from me so that we can change this rule or so that we can change this ordinance or we can change this requirement? And if more of us are willing to start doing small things at the local level like that, getting active, supporting our mutual aid. For people up in Washington, they can play to real rent de wash. You can find out who belongs to the land you're on. Find out if they're a federally recognized tribe. And this goes for people in Australia, too. This is a global issue. Everywhere people left Europe and went out into the rest of the world, we have disrupted patterns. We have disrupted nature. We've done it in Brazil to the point we might not be able to turn it back right now. And we can expend a lot of energy being very upset about that and it can trigger depression. Or we can go, okay, this is where we're at right now. What can I do? What is in my control to make a change? Just like we talked about last week with everything going on in Eastern Europe. It would have been very easy for the people in Ukraine to do the same thing that the people in Crimea did. That's not the choice they made. They decided it was worth standing up and working together and taking a risk and being vulnerable and doing it anyway. Most of us are not aware 
how many people are also doing those same risks here in the US. There are people taking similar risks in Australia. There are people taking similar risks in South Africa. There are water protectors and indigenous people fighting for the planet who are taking risks every single day and it doesn't get covered in the news. It doesn't get covered in the media. And maybe we need to start asking ourselves why. Who benefits? And is this the world that we are willing to live in? Or are we willing to start to make changes and let the change begin with me? I encourage you to continue coloring even without the videos. Set aside 15 to 20 minutes every day that you get to do something that brings you joy. Color, paint, crochet, whatever makes you happy. And I hope that you find something that you're able to do where you can allow your mind to just be. To recognize the emotion and accept it and just be. Hope to see you next Monday night.